thank you for joining Randy Houston and Dave Hogan on a podcast we call Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. Hello, Randy. There's so much about uh, the music associated with World War II that uh, we didn't get around talking about. I want to mention a couple of other things. If you listen to our previous podcast, you heard us talking about Tex Ritter, and to- we told a couple of stories about Tex Ritter. But I did want to mention on our second podcast, as we talk about songs from World War II, that the biggest song that Tex Ritter had in World War II was called There's a Gold Star in Her Window. Yeah. There's a gold star in her window. A gold star mother was a mother who lost her son in a battle. And that song by Tex Ritter was tremendously popular during World War II. Some of the other artists that were popular in World War II and helped spread country music across the country. A lot of soldiers had never been uh, exposed to country music. But in the the rec centers and even on the battlefield, uh, soldiers from the South would be singing a country music song. And a soldier from maybe Montana or some other state that where country music at that time was not popular would become acquainted with country music and take it back home to his hometown. Yeah. But another artist, and we all know this one, Ernest Tubb. I'm walking the floor over you. He was just getting into country music during World War II. He had a song called Soldier's Last Letter. When a postman delivered a letter... It filled her heart with joy, but she didn't know it was the last letter from her darling boy. And it's a sad story about a a mother who uh, gets a letter from her son and then finds out that that's the last letter that he was killed in the war. And and she became a a gold star uh, mother that uh, Tex Ritter's song related to, talked about, sung about, sang about. They, um, I've heard my dad refer to songs like that as a real tearjerker, mm-hmm. a tearjerker. Uh, but on the serious side, it was very important to, you know, music, uh, television was not around. It was just being in, being in its infancy in World War II. Yeah. Of course, a lot of things stopped. I read a story one time that said television would have come, if it hadn't been for World War II, television would have become popular in the late 30s and early 40s. But during World War II, everything everything stopped uh, except uh, manufacturing products for the war effort. Yeah. So television was kind of put on the shelf until later in the 1940s, and it was in the 1950s uh, before television become, became mainstream. So recorded music was... Stymied a while there. Well, recorded music w- was... Oh, was the replacement? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah. was, it was uh, pre-television. Gotcha. And Floyd Tillman. I've heard that name. You'll find his name as the writer of a bunch of different country music hits. But he popularized a song during World War II called Each Night at Nine. Each Night at Nine. Please think of me, dear, each night at nine. And I was doing some research, and and I pulled up the title, that title, Each Night at Nine, and lo and behold, I found a Willie Nelson recording. <laughs> you know, Willie, I guess, has sung every song that's ever been written. Yeah, I agree. But what impressed me about Willie Nelson's version, and I think it came out, it, it was not a hit song. It was not what they now refer to as a, as a radio 
uh, hit, Made for Radio. You know, the artist, try to find that one song yeah. off, a, off, a, off an album that they send to radio stations that will become a hit for them. This was not a hit, but it was one of, on one of uh, one of Willie's albums, and you can find it on the internet. Google Willie Nelson and Each Night at Nine. And one of the reasons to ring up Willie is because at that time when he recorded this, he was in the 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 he was. This was when he was at a peak as far as his singing voice was concerned. It, it's better Willie than the Willie that started and better Willie than the current Willie. And, of course, Willie is 90 years old now, and and you, you obviously are going to lose a great deal of your ability to enunciate, and I think Willie also has some breathing problems. But and you know he, what? And he now sits down as he does his right, shows. Right, right. But he was in fine voice. His voice in that song, if you listen to Willie Nelson and Each Night at Nine, his his voice, I was trying to think when I was listening to it, it's kind of like molasses flowing along. I was trying to, in my mind, yeah. to figure what does that voice remind me of? It was so smooth. <laughs> So you got to, when we finish this program, pull it up so we can listen to it. I will. Each I'm night to. at nine. Now, during World War II, y- you remember the name. You've heard it. You run around during World War II. To Tokyo Rose. Yes. The name Tokyo Rose. She was the spy, right? The- Tokyo Rose had a radio program. Yeah. She was yeah. propaganda. There were two uh, female, we'd call them disc jockeys today, who became popular in World War II as propagandists. One was Axis Sally out of Germany and Tokyo Rose out of Japan. And their programs were directed to American soldiers to try to make them so homesick that would they'd become less efficient mm-hmm. as fighters. But ultimately, the program was to try to get the soldiers to desert, to, to, to give up. And each night at nine, that was one of the songs that was played most often by Axis Sally, in Germany, and Tokyo Rose in Japan. They were on strong, and both of them, by the way, were American citizens. Tokyo Rose uh, was born to immigrant parents in the United States, immigrants from Japan. She had gone back home to Japan to help care for an aunt of hers who was ill, and she was caught there during when the war started and she couldn't leave. And she had a job as a secretary at a radio station. So she was recruited, and I'm sure uh, forced at that time, to become what became known as Tokyo Rose. Actually, Tokyo Rose was just a nickname. She didn't go by that name on the air. That's the nickname she was given by uh, the American troops. Okay. And Axis Sally also was a uh, U.S. citizen who was in Germany when the war broke out, and it's a very similar story. Eddie Arnold had a song called Did You See My Daddy Over There? You can imagine what that song was like. Yeah. Johnny Bond. And Johnny Bond was a an artist that was popular, and he was also a great songwriter. Kind of been lost to history. You don't hear the name Johnny Bond as you do some of the other uh, artists of the 40s. And he had a song called I'm a Prisoner of War on a Foreign Shore. And in the song, he asked Americans to please remember soldiers who were captured by the enemy in uh, World War II and became POWs. You know, I like museums, and I mentioned visiting the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans. 
Another museum that I visited, and I'd never heard of it, was down near America's Georgia. It's a POW museum. And you go into that POW museum, it's very impressive. And it, it, uh, the reason it's there in uh, near America's Georgia is because there's a, uh, there was a prison back during the Civil War and the name of the prison escapes me at the moment. But there was a large prison there where Union troops were sent when they were captured. So that's why this POW Museum is located near America's Georgia. And in the museum, you, they, they recreate, for instance, just to give you one example, they uh, create the, re, the they recreated the kind of orders that John McCain, the late Senator John McCain, uh, lived in when he was a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. They recreated it there. Mm-hmm. I bet that's haunting. It is. You know, it's, it's like a cage. And he was held like that for five years, right? Yes, and he had an offer to be released because his dad was also a military man and John had rank John McCain in World War II uh, uh, rather in the, the, the Vietnam War when this happened and they offered to release him and he said I'm not going to leave my buddies Yeah, you release me you release all of them We, yeah. and so he stayed one of the great American heroes, Absolutely. John McCain. Absolutely. And uh, a former candidate for president of the United States. We've been talking about World War II, and I and when you get into the, the Korean War, I have memories. I have some memories of World War II because I was born during World War II, and I remember my dad coming home. don't remember him leaving. I was too young to remember that, but I remember him well, I guess my earliest memory is a big to a kid, you know, who's about three or four years old. A, a car was a big thing, but I remember this big black car driving up our driveway out in the country with a telegram from my mom that my dad had been injured, had been wounded in World War II. But and I remember my dad coming home from World War II. But when you get up to the Korean War, I was old enough to remember a lot of uh, a lot of things about the Korean War. Following they had in the newspapers, they had a, a chart every day of where the battles were going on and how far south the Chinese and North Koreans, how far south they had... Uh, uh, Overtaken. Overtaken. The, and then, of course, South Korea eventually. You know, that war has never been officially ended. I didn't know that. There was just a truce. Wow. Never officially ended. Nobody surrendered. Nobody declared victory in the Korean War. But I bring that up, bring the Korean War up, to mention another song. And I don't remember who the artist was, because, but I remember it being played on the radio. It was called Atomic Power. The movie Open Oppenheimer just recently won all those Oscars. Yes. And nominated for 15. Right. And Atomic Power, at that time, I remember it going through drills in school. What to do in case there was a a, a, a nuclear, nuclear fallout, a, yeah. A, a atomic fallout was what it was called in, atomic yeah. bomb. Yeah. The word nuclear was not as popular at that time. Uh, fallout shelters, yeah. markings, the triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw those everywhere. Uh, we had those drills in school, too, uh, a, a later on. But I don't have the memories you do of the Korean War. It, that didn't start for me till the Vietnam War. But uh, go on with your memories from uh, Korean War. Well, they're they're there, but but pretty vague. I don't remember. I remember that hearing that song about the atomic power on the radio. 
But let's move on to the era that you're talking about, the, the Vietnam War, because it was very important in the world of country music. Well, I got to confess to you, if there's a time and a, a slot in my life, well, there are several slots in my life where I steered away from country radio. Mm-hmm. And that was one of them. Another one was when you and I worked together in the adult standards format. But in my teenage years through the Vietnam era, uh, I was hung up on these Vietnam protest songs. Mm -hmm. I got swept up in that. And, uh, and I got, uh, where have all the flowers gone? Oh, and war. Good God. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. The answer, my friend is blowing in the wind. All those songs. Bob Dylan. Pete Seeger wrote Where Have All the Flowers Gone, but it was popularized by Peter, Paul, and Mary. And not necessarily a country. I think the Kingston Trio also had a recording of Where Have All the Flowers Gone. They did. They did. Popular during the Vietnam War. They did. I've played it. Yeah. And the first recording that was written by, first song recorded by one of the great country music songwriters was a song called Hello Vietnam written by Tom P. Hall. Wow. And that song Hello Vietnam popularized by Johnny Wright and Kitty Wells was the first song that was a hit written by Tom T. Hall. Great storyteller, great songwriter, great performer all around. We all love Tom T. Hall. You know, one of the one of the songs that really made an impact on me, and I really didn't uh, pay too much attention. I didn't. Pay, I wish I had paid more attention to the songs and the writings of John Prime. Yes. You know the song Sam Stone. Oh, what a what a an incredible song that is about uh, the Vietnam soldier getting hooked on drugs. Mm and coming back home and what's the the line in that song that just that hole in his arm where the money goes there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes right john prine wrote that song called it sam stone because he was uh draft age during the vietnam war and he was drafted but he didn't go to to fight he was uh, stationed in germany but a lot of his friends schoolmates went to Vietnam yeah and he writes about this one particular friend who came home from Vietnam hooked addicted on, addicted to drugs yeah and if you've never heard it google it Sam Stone yeah by John Prime and of course there were lots of other songs during the Vietnam War uh and one song that kind of related to the war was Merle Haggard and Oki from Muskogee. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the fight inside of me. And there's a song playing in my head right this minute that I have to mention was Credence Clearwater Revival and Running Through the Jungle. Yes, yes. It's haunting. It go, is. Put, go listen to Credence and uh, Running Through the Jungle. We want to bring up Toby Keith because we lost Toby just recently. What a voice Toby Keith had. Patriotic guy, too. And he received, he had a song called Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue. Remember that? Oh, definitely. I play, I'm still on the air, and I do early mornings. And at uh, 6.45 every morning, I play a patriotic song of the day, sponsored by Miller Brothers. And uh, and I play a lot of Toby Keith songs. And Toby, if, wherever there was American soldiers, Toby was there. He toured uh, and received the, the, the Spirit of the USO Award, the highest award given by... Uh, USO, and of course the USO was established way back in World War II, and Bob Hope and a lot of entertainers right. travel to uh, areas of battle to entertain the soldiers, or maybe in, in addition to. I know sometimes they got pretty close to where yeah. the soldiers were fighting. They they got real close. But also they entertain 
troops wherever they were stationed. Yeah. Uh, Anywhere they, in the world. Yeah. And Toby Keith, whether it was Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, Guam, Toby Keith was, went and entertained our troops. And our troops loved him because I, I, I sometimes play these songs from YouTube, and there's a video that goes with the recording of these songs. And the crowd, the soldiers loved Toby Keith. It, it was just incredible to watch. So that uh, kind of brings us up to the present day. We've been talking, in case you missed our last show, you can go back and hear it. One of the things that uh, happens with podcasts, you can go back, I'm sure, in our case, and listen to previous podcasts. They're all on YouTube now. All our podcasts are on YouTube, if you like that, uh, if you prefer that. But they're also Spotify, Apple iTunes, wherever. They're everywhere. You can go back and listen to our previous show yes. where we started talking about country music and how World War II helped popularize country music across the United States and ultimately around the world. You sure can. And Dave, I thank you so much for all the research you've done into these uh, stories about uh, wars and country music. And we're going to take a break. We'll be back uh, with another. Ex- oh, by the way. Oh, In addition to World War II, another event, and this, I guess you, it's a, it's a series of, of events that propelled country music was the Hillbilly Highway. Now, I'm not talking about the Hillbilly Highway up in eastern Kentucky. I'm talking about the migration of Southerners to the north, uh, when World War II, when they came home from World War II. The factories in Detroit were making cars. We'll talk about that maybe on the next podcast. That's a great one, the Hillbilly Highway. Thank you so much for joining us on Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. Be sure to click the subscribe button for another episode of Hot Mike with Randy Houston and Dave Hogan.